So would anybody pick me up if I was standing on the side of the road trying to hitchhike like this? <laughs> okay, now imagine this instead. Imagine that you're in Sierra Leone in a road kind of like that, and you have four people with four machetes sitting out there asking for a ride. Would you pick them up? Four guys. <laughs> Well, there they are. This is, the, this is the road. Well, I actually did pick them up. And only a few limbs decapitated, that's it, and I survived. But basically, it was part of a journey to visit all 54 African countries. These are my GPS coordinates of where I went. I spent about five weeks in each country, visiting each country. I was climbing the tallest mountain of every African country. And I picked up 3,000 hitchhikers. So those four Sierra Leoneans with their machetes were just a little bit of all the adventures I had. Now, why did I do this? Because Africa matters now more than it ever has before. In the past, Africans represented just 5% of the total human population. That happened in 1900. Today, they're moving on to, by the end of the century, they'll be 35% of the entire population. So you can see, humanity is moving toward becoming Africans. And it gets more serious than that. In the year, 20, in the year 2100, at the end of this century, you're going to see that the five of the top 10 biggest countries are African. And that most of the newborns will be African. In 1900, there were three times more Europeans than there were Africans. By the end of this century, sorry, actually just in 30 years from now, there'll be three times more Africans than Europeans. And one country, Nigeria, will have as many people as all of Europe by the year 2080. And yet, we know so little about this continent. In the next century, there might be as many Asians as there are Africans. And in fact, the United Nations did an interesting study that they projected that if nothing changes as far as fertility rates, you're going to have 134 trillion human beings on this planet, of which 85% are African. That's a lot. <laughs> now, they're not saying this is going to happen because obviously that would affect how easy it is to park. But what they are saying is that the demographics are changing unlike ever before and that we need to pay attention to this continent because whether it's a third or half of humanity, that's quite a bit. And yet it is the most misunderstood continent of all. So how would I be able to try to understand this continent? Well, I decided I would go about and pick up a bunch of people as I'm driving through all 54 African countries. And I would stay with them, stay in their homes, eat their food, see where they get their water, chat with them. I speak many of the, the, the most popular African languages so I could communicate with most of them and try to understand them from the ground level. Because you could sit back and look at Snapchat, you could look at Instagram, but there's nothing like being connected one-on-one -on -one and actually meeting these people and understanding about their background. Now, I did the first part of the journey by myself, but the second half of the journey, I actually met my wife, Rejoice. Now, I never actually asked for money most of the time, but sometimes they would say, hey, I'll pay you 100 for this. I would say, no, no, you can pay me 50 for the same ride. And they would actually do a lot of my work. So instead of me having to clear the trees out of the side of the road, they would be able to do it for me. Or they would. So it wasn't just a, me helping them. They were helping me often by inviting me into their homes and doing all sorts of things like that. And I would actually help transport those things. This is when I was by myself in Zambia, and trying to move trees in Zambia was, was quite difficult. So it was kind of a win-win situation in that way. And here you can see them at the top of the car, moving things, helping me out. So it was a great way for us to kind of bond. And there I am in Niger, picking up some uh, Muslims. Now, as I mentioned, Rejoice was, and you'll see a picture of her right here, she's from Cameroon, and it changed the dynamics of when she came on board. 
It's also at one point, for about one month, her brother and I traveled together. So we were in Chad, and we went to, in the middle of nowhere, we we're trying to get to the tallest mountain of Chad, and then to the tallest mountain of Libya. And it's very desolate out there. And we met this old man who wanted us to give him a ride to his village. There he is. And he was very pious. He would stop and say, hey, I need to pray. I need to pray toward Mecca. And so we would stop in the middle of nowhere in Chad so that he could to do his prayers. And along the way, we were in this valley. And you can see a picture of it here. We were driving along. And this small little antelope was running so fast. It was like a baby antelope. And it actually burst its heart. It died and killed itself in the process. And we picked it up. And we had to slit his, we didn't have to, but we decided to put him out of its misery. And then we took him, after slaughtering him, take him to our camp. We went to the, one of the most remote places on the planet. And then the old man and Mustafa, my, my brother-in-law, went ahead by pulling the animal to pieces. And he said, hey, look, this is where his heart, you can see where his heart ruptured. And you can see this is his liver. And I was like, how do you know all this stuff, Mustafa? And he's like, I'm an African. <laughs> we do this stuff all the time. And so that's the first lesson I kind of learned from all this, is that Africans are far more connected than we are to their food. And that's something that we can all learn from. The second thing, when I was going through all these different countries, the roads themselves were quite difficult at times. Um, my ride became quite popular. Sometimes people would almost fight over getting onto my ride because it was just basically a free ride for most of the time. But the roads were treacherous. We actually drove across the entire Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the size of Western Europe. And it's calling them roads is a bit generous at the time. You can kind of see some of the conditions of the roads, and there would be a lot of accidents along the way. Now, a lot of people probably ask themselves, OK, come on, Francis. There's got to be some bad story that you had. 3,000 hitchhikers. How could nothing have gone wrong? OK, I'll give you one bad story of where something went wrong. We were in the DRC, in Democratic Republic of Congo. And many times, people would help us whenever we got stuck in the mud, which was often, to get, uh, get us out. And one time, we had some hitchhikers with us. And there was this young man who helped us try to get out of it. In the meantime, he very quietly went into Rejoice's purse, which was in the back seat, and stole a bunch of money, hid it somewhere. And so uh, we quickly realized that as soon as we left the spot, within 100 meters, we realized this. And just by luck, there was a police officer, a military guy, an undercover police officer and a military guy on the back of a motorcycle driving by us. So we flagged them down. And we had the guy get shaken down. This is the, the thief who stole the money. And you can see the military guy with his AK-47 on his right shoulder. And he has this kind of rope on his left shoulder. And it was with that rope, he, he put the young boy down. And he said, OK, how much should I whip this guy? And so he just pulled out the rope and just gave him a beating in front of all these villagers who were all around just to humiliate him. And he asked me, should I do more? I was like, OK, go do a little bit more. <laughs> I was really pissed at the time because I was like, I'm helping you hitchhike, and you're stealing from me. Um, and so all these guys uh, witnessed this kind of public humiliation. The sad thing about this story is not that we got back the money or that we gave the money, some of the money to the, the people who helped us, but the fact that the young boy does this all the time. Why? Because his father is a police chief. And so because of the corruption that exists still in parts of Africa, they, he can get away with murder. Um, and so that's why he just does this with impunity. But this story tells you one thing. It's the big number two lesson I learned from Africa, which is that Africa is incredibly safe. Now, about one in 100 hitchhikers that we picked up were military people. They needed to get from one station to another station, and so they just didn't have a means of transport. And so we would do that for them as a favor. But we didn't really need them. Because as I said, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you got lucky. Well, how can you get lucky 3,000 times, right? I don't think so. And so here I am in Niger, 
uh, they, these officers helped me out getting out of a bind when my car broke down in the middle of Sahara, the military people. But let's move on to Somalia. Somalia has a level of formality that you can only see in the customs office and the immigration office signs. Um, and in Somalia, we had one police guy in our car as we crossed the northern part of Somalia to go to Puntland, to go to the tallest mountain of Somalia. And we got to hang out in the towns. We got to go eat the food. We got to really integrate there. Nothing happened. It's hard to know, you know if something might have happened. But the bottom line, nothing did. Then we also went to Darfur. We went to West Darfur, East Darfur, North and South Darfur, and Central Darfur. At this point, the Sudanese military said, we're going to give you, at one point, 50 military people in eight vehicles to protect us as we were crossing through a section of Darfur that they thought was dangerous. They even had a rocket launcher uh, with us along the way. There it is. There's a rocket launcher protecting us, for God's sakes. But I'm telling you this story not because it is, you know, this is scary Africa. It's just that A, nothing happened. B, this is the only time, I'm telling you because it's an exceptional story, because most of the time I was driving by myself without any assistance, and Africa, nothing else happened. I just already told you the worst story. Now, the third lesson is that Afro-optimism rules the continent. For example, sometimes they put stop signs in roads that really don't need a stop sign because the road is so destroyed and gutted. There's another example of Afro-optimism. I saw this little boy in Guinea. He was like 10 years old, maybe 12 years old, and he was walking without water in the brutal heat. And I picked him up thinking that he was only going to go one or two kilometers, but he ended up going like 20 kilometers. And he was, I'm going to make it somehow. And he probably would have made it. Um, but I'll tell you the, the, the funniest story of Afro-optimism. I got across the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and got to, I was going to another romantic de touristic destination called the Central African Republic, and I was trying to cross a river. And I asked the guys, well, why isn't there a bridge here? Because I expected a bridge. I was like, no, no, there's no bridge. So I said, but we can get you across. I said, well, how are you going to get me across? Well, we're going to string together six canoes, and we'll put your car on top of that. I was like, really? Has, have you ever done this before? Oh, yeah, we've done it before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever lost a car? Oh, yes, 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 we've lost cars. <laughs> Great. Sign me up. So there we had, we put the car on six canoes, and with that incredible optimism, we went ahead and did it. And we got to the other side of Bangui, the capital of Central African Republic. How about that? <laughs> it was incredible. Uh, so that's another characteristic that I, that I noticed. And the fourth thing, sorry, the third thing is that renewables are exploding. Uh, in other words, you hear about it, you might read about it, but I actually got to see it. When I talked to all these different hitchhikers, I would ask them if they had solar panels in their house. It, wind power is not that popular, but solar panels definitely were. And it was amazing just how often it would be. In Malawi, for example, we stayed with this family, and they had it as well. But it was a funny story when I went to, uh, to Cape Verde, which is an island nation off the west coast of Africa. I talked to this guy named Tino, and I said, Cape Verde in 2025 is supposed to be 100% renewable. That's what the government says. Do you think you can make it? 2025, 100% renewable? And Tino, he said, oh yeah, no problem. We just won't turn on the lights. <laughs> but now the, the other thing that I learned is that malaria, which is something that has plagued the continent forever, it's kind of like Africans look at it like we look at the flu as influenza. It's not such a big deal as you might think. Nowadays, you can, get, you can be in the most remote African village, and if you have malaria and the symptoms of malaria, for like a dollar or less sometimes, you can treat it. I know this because I got malaria not once, not twice, but six times I got malaria. Now, it's no fun, but, and I got it in different countries, and it was, it was tough, and it really debilitates you. But it's amazing how much progress I could see on the land that Africans have made in conquering this disease and this plasmonium. It's really amazing the progress that they've made. So much so that Africans have a tendency sometimes to blame all their ailments on malaria. You know, my elbow hurts, it must be malaria. Everything was malaria. But in fact, if you look at the, the malaria deaths worldwide today, it's about 435,000. 
If you look at the influenza deaths, it's just actually a bit higher. So we've done tremendous progress with regard to conquering malaria, and that is a, is, is a wonderful thing that I got to see firsthand. And the, fifth, the sixth thing I would mention is that obesity is a bigger problem than starvation. When I was growing up, I heard bad news about Ethiopia and starving people. It's, it's, it's actually obesity. In Ghana, it's nearly 3 out of 10 are obese. It's happening also with African children. Obesity is skyrocketing. And also what I found fascinating is that women tended to be far bigger than men on average. And I never did understand that. But it was when I came back to the United States, I looked at statistics. And in the United States, there's not that much difference between men and women obesity. But when you look at the African American population, the women have a much greater obesity than men in the African American population, as you can see right in this next graph, right there. So, and I saw the same phenomenon in Africa. I don't really understand why, because the African women tend to haul the water and haul the wood and do a lot more of the physical activity. They have babies on their back. They're doing a lot of physical activity. Now, I asked a lot of men. I would have locker room talk with them because I had a lot of opportunity to hang out with men in Africa. And I asked them, OK, would you prefer a thin woman, a medium-sized, or a big woman? And, and about a majority would say medium-sized, but about a quarter said, I would rather have a big, big woman. I'm like, OK, great. So this has brought me to my next lesson in Africa, is that all women in Africa are beautiful. And it was so refreshing, because in coming from this society, where you have to be thin in order to be beautiful, in Africa, if you're a big woman, you're going to have admirers all over the place. And, you're gonna f and, and it was so nice to see that, that they didn't have that kind of pressure. They could just be themselves. And that's something that. Also, I just learned from picking up hitchhikers all along the way. So those are my seven lessons I learned from picking 3,000 hitchhikers. I hope I've inspired you to travel, not just to travel in general, but to travel to Africa. And not just to go to the standard places like Kenya or Morocco or South Africa or Egypt, but to go a little bit off the beaten track, to understand this misunderstood continent to realize that it's changing faster than any other continent out there. And that is something that we need to understand because soon, they're either going to be a third of humanity or half of humanity. And so if you want to go ahead living, we could ignore a continent when it's just less than 5% of the population, but now it's too important to ignore. So I hope that is the message that I'm going to leave you with so that you go off and travel and explore Africa. Thank you.